My name is Ed Anderson. I'm the DevOps practitioner slash army of one, at least until Monday, at a company called Real Self up in Seattle. A uh, little bit about me. In the late 90s, I got started doing dial-up internet support for ISPs in Mississippi. Yes, we did have the internet in Mississippi in the late 90s. Uh, though, I mean, look at the results. Maybe it wasn't necessarily a good thing. Uh, but after I did that, moved into networking for like two years, totally learned everything there was to know about networking, started doing Unix and infrastructure support, and 16 years later, I still know more about networking than I do about Unix and infrastructure support. So, you know, choose your battles wisely, kids. Uh, you probably haven't heard about the company that I work for, RealSelf, unless you have been in the market for like cosmetic surgery and dentistry, or Botox, or like a Brazilian butt lift, because we are a review site focused on that topic. And I bring that up because uh, cosmetic surgery is here in America like uh, a stigmatized slash polarizing topic. We don't have to get into why that is or you know anything, but uh, I bring it up because at our work, we're always thinking about how uh, how we can bridge the gap with people who are different from us and have different point of views because our subject matter is, you know, only not easy. It's also something that, like, if you put on Reddit, you can quickly discover that the internet is a terrible place that you never, ever want to return to again. All right. So, uh, cosmetic surgery and dentistry, people come to our site. It's pictures. It's stories. Uh, and again, it's like a safe place, right? Like I said, you're not going to put this kind of stuff on Reddit because you're not going to get constructive feedback from Reddit about changing your body or, you know, I mean, people who are born into the wrong gender and want to get quality information about that. There's sort of a limited number of places you can do that. We're one of them. Uh, and like I said, it just keeps us mindful about stigma. Um, and I think that recently, thanks to this DevOps movement thing that's going on, we have done a lot to uh, bridge the gap and realize the humanity of our business partners in development and possibly even project management if you don't work at a Fortune 500 where your project manager still hates you and life. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity for us to still do that with security, though, because um, Security organizations are frequently not integrated into operations or development, and that makes it super easy for us to dehumanize them and to uh, assume that our concerns are not the same because they're not integrated with our teams. So, long lead end. Thank you for your patience. Um, I have another disclaimer to give you. We're going to be talking about uh, data breaches today, and that's something that there isn't a lot of very high-quality information about. There's a huge diversity of requirements around, around reporting for breach information, and like there's this really awesome report that Verizon puts out called the uh, DBIR, Data Breach Investigations Report, uh, which is as high-quality as any information there is to find out about this topic, but their first disclaimer is we don't know everything, the problem's bigger than we can admit to here, and hold on to it. So when you see things that look like facts here, they're really facts. Okay, are you with me? We're talking about facts. We're using the good data that we have, and we're going with that. So uh, don't be surprised if you think that some things are not the same as you think they are. All right. Um, Talking about definitions, to pwn downstairs, they still have audio modems. Uh, for those of you that are like under the age of 30, may not be familiar with this, we used to have to use telephones to call into the internet. It was awesome, much better than not having the internet at all. It wasn't awesome because every now and then your mom would like pick up the phone and it would confuse the heck out of the modem and you would be disconnected from whatever game you were playing and when you came back, you would be dead or owned in some other way. So uh, to pwn comes from that, ping owned. Maybe people just weren't very uh, you know, accurate typist. I don't know, it doesn't really matter, but that's what we're talking about is uh, losing control. And um, inside pones, these break into two major categories, incidents and breaches. Incidents happen all the time. 
They're really interesting. I'm not going to talk about them because they're not as interesting as breach data. And breach data is when uh, an incident escalates to data being exfiltrated to um, an unauthorized party. Yeah. And then we need to talk a little bit about stigma because stigma is the market disgrace that sets like a person or group apart uh, when we label events with stigmatic words. Uh, they become part of uh, stereotyped groups. And these negative attitudes help us to create prejudice, which leads to negative actions and discrimination. And that's the path to the dark side, which we don't want to actively be a part of. <clears throat> All right, so it's my position that the good guys can actually work really hard and do nothing wrong. And you can still end up pwned. Um, you know, welcome to the internet, man. It's a, it's a huge business getting the data that you have about your customers out to people that are not your business, and uh, they will go after you incredibly aggressively. Um, and I think that it's time for us to bring in a revolution about how we think about our own security, how you think about the security of the organization that you work in, about other organizations, and, um, I, again, I just really think there's a strong parallel to what's happening in DevOps to happen to security, and we can bring them into the fold to be our um, you know, business partners. So audience participation time, favorite part of the first slide. Can anybody here willing to, there's no company name, so you're safe, right, on our name tags. Uh, anybody here willing to admit to having a security incident in the past year, which is when someone tried to get into your systems and your defenses worked? All right, there's only like four of you, so as I filter down here, this is gonna get tough. Uh, <laughs> all right, now, who had an incident where your security defenses did not work as planned? Yes. Thank you, you are my people. These are difficult things to admit, right? Because like now you're bad uh, for doing that. Anybody willing to admit to a breach in the, past, uh, in the past calendar year? Somebody you didn't intend got your data out? Yeah, I didn't figure anybody would admit to that. But how about this one? Uh, who's made fun of somebody else for having had a breach? Take like a little uh, schadenfreude in the Sony hack or LinkedIn. Yeah, that's right. See, that's OK. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to help you to change your mind, because um, I think that this is like a super complicated problem. And it's, I mean, it's just staggering to me. So the first thing we can do to help keep our um, empathy close at hand is think about who's impacted. In the DBIR last year, they can confirm that there were 120 million people who had either their personally identifiable information, personal health information, or uh, personal financial information stolen and exfiltrated by way of data provided breaches in the year 2015. 120 million is a big number. We frequently deal in big numbers, but we're doing it with like bytes or things like that that aren't very, uh, very relatable. So let's turn these into people. Very slowly, we will turn them into people. Uh, yeah, 120 million people is almost exactly the population of all the red states on that map. It's not one in five of people in those states. Uh, if you're like me, my family happens to live entirely in red states, aside from me. So there's like 25 people in that map that are sharing my last name, my mom, who is like desperately avoiding trying to do business on the internet with like every fiber of her being is subject to this problem. And uh, I think that it's both intimidating and it's incredibly scary. I think there are a lot of things that are incredibly scary that are going on right now, and this is only one of them. Uh, so in February, 80 million individuals' records were stolen from the Blue Cross Health Insurance member company, Anthem. In June, the Office of Personnel Management here in the United States had a breach that they thought was 4 million people. Under deeper investigation, they found out it was 11 million people. And then as they kept you know, rolling over rocks and finding bugs, they uh, identified that the Anthem exploit in February was one of the major ways that the bad guys got in. Um, so it's like trickle down effects. In July, Ashley Madison happened. Probably, if you're like me, 
you had some trouble not, uh, not finding a little humor in that, but uh, you know, I too am human and I'm working on this myself, like uh, I'm feeling more bad about it now than I did then. And uh, in October, there is a credit reporting agency called Experian who reported a loss of personal information of 15 million T-Mobile customers. So those T-Mobile customers weren't even doing business directly with this other company who lost their data. I mean, uh, I don't know, this, this is just, I really get stuck on this. I don't want to rant about it too much. But um, so here's the deal, is that for people in the Black Hat community, uh, personally identifiable information is like super, super valuable. It's valuable to them because they can gather it and then extort companies to, you know, oh, I won't release this if you give me hundreds of Bitcoin. Or uh, they can also resell it, you know. There's the dark web where tens of thousands of email addresses sell for a couple of US dollars. And when you get out of the United States, that stuff adds up really quickly and it, it changes people's lives. So they're, I mean, basically organized businesses around getting this done. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the people that are involved in getting your data out. Uh, there's a common trope in information security. Probably you are hearing this from your executive management more than your peers, that the insider threat is going to take our data. The people we work with and love every day that we've extended trust to are going to take our data. But statistically speaking, that's actually not that significant. And even when this population's assessed, it includes the guy who was driving the backup tapes to the offsite location and got into a car wreck and lost the backup tapes or gave them to his kid to copy White Snake or whatever. Uh, but ultimately, they only represent about 15% of data breaches in 2015. So, I mean, like, that's something you need to be aware and cognizant of, but this is not the major problem. The major problem is the external threat. These are people who have no relationship with your organization other than the fact that they want what you've got to use it to their end. So, uh, they're frequently credited to being in organized crime, especially uh, phishing style attacks and uh, things that are based around email, more targeted attacks come from organized crime. So it's like this weird mix of Gordon Gecko slash Land Party slash Tony Montana, uh, you know, all coming after your stuff. And uh, in 2014, the DBIR tried to put a dollar value on the amount on the penalties and the fiscal impact of exfiltrated data, and it came to $400 million. So, I mean, like, these are very sophisticated people using very sophisticated tools coming after you with a vengeance. And they represent the lion's share of, of uh, breach. So, like, 85% of breach happens from, um, from these, like, criminal organizations uh, every now and then a script kitty gets through, but I mean, like, dude, you're probably safe against the script kitties if you're doing this, if you're doing operations professionally, you know, they're relatively easy to defend against. And then there's this, like, really small segment, less than 5% of other threats, which is your business partners uh, often colluding with an internal party to get it out. And they get classified in their own way in these reports because their behavior is really interesting, not because the amount of data that they exfiltrate is really interesting. Um, and so let's, let's roll this back to people, right? Uh, in your personal lives, we don't blame the victim when they are subject to something like gaslighting, right? Uh, someone intentionally deceived you, that is not your fault. Uh, and it's really easy for us when we're talking to each other as individuals to keep that in mind. Or if you lock your bike outside in the bike rack, some dude comes by with bolt cutters, steals it. I mean, that's a three minute operation. You know, most bikes are stolen in less than five minutes, whether you lock them up or not. And uh, we similarly don't blame the victims when those things happen. And I'm not trying to say that security breaches, data breaches are the same as crimes against people where people are hurt and they're very tangible, but I am encouraging you to keep in mind that the victims here are people and the people 
are also responsible for trying to defend against these threats, doing the best that they can, and uh, it's just really all about the people. So security ends up being this really complicated thing. I'm sad to say that I was like panicking over giving this talk in the other room and I wasn't able to really focus on the last talk, but uh, the last speaker, I saw some of his slides, he was talking about this. Um, computer security and network systems, so complicated. Uh, and frequently when information is exfiltrated, we don't end up with high quality information about its fiscal impact or the people that are involved for like months at a time. Uh, it can even be years before that data becomes public. And it's partly complicated because of how complex our business is, right? I mean, uh, people are targeted through email. People are targeted through key loggers. You can be spearfished into installing a key logger. And then John from accounting is actually, you know, someone over in Waziristan with a, uh, with a computer who's, you know, just trying to get by. Um, and it's complicated because uh, we frequently don't know the impact for time. Uh, inf exfiltrated data can be held indefinitely and used against you, and they're frequently sold in, a in aggregate. I got an email as I was getting on the plane to come down here from beautiful, sunny Seattle uh, that, from Pandora that was like, hey, Ed, we wanted to let you know that your account was compromised in a LinkedIn exfiltration the other day. Why does Pandora care? Who do they know that I am, that I am on LinkedIn? Like, what's their common sense of my identity? And how is that their responsibility? And why should I care that Pandora knows that I was in LinkedIn? I mean, um, the interconnectedness of services is something that has been like super awesome for us because we can make better understandings about like who's using our services and how we can tailor our products to them. But it's also really terrible because at that point, our security and our ability to protect our own users' data is a shared responsibility. Man, I am going to be running short on time here. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. So in 2015, 4,500 events with confirmed breach data. That's almost 12 a day. Frequently, the time to compromise is measured in 67% of the time it's in days, in 20% of the time it's in minutes, in 7% of the time it's in seconds, and in 3% of the time it's in hours. That's like 98% of all events happen in days or less. I would like for you to be thinking about that when you leave here uh, because you need to be thinking about how quickly your own security defenses work. Are you able to respond in less than days? Hopefully yes, but maybe not. Um, are you able to respond in less than minutes or hours? I think that your questions are probably getting a lot harder at that point, but the people who are coming to steal your data are going to be that fast about it. Um, and you need to know like what data is exposed, where, so that you can make quick assessments and respond. Um, I did a, a quick search just because I like to see what's happening in Mark Zuckerberg's life. Uh, so I looked for him on this haveibeenpwned.com, uh, marketfacebook.com. I'm sure that's not actually the email address that he's using, but he was located in five breaches. These people don't know him. These people don't know me, but they can still correlate that in mere moments. Hmm. All right, here we go. So let's talk about the anatomy of attack. I have a friend who had a security event not long ago. And <clears throat> this is what happened. These bars are measured in like two to five minute spans. Uh, and it's kind of important to understand where, I wonder if this thing, yeah, there we go. All right, so our friend John Snow comes in early probing here. These are less than one request a minute. Uh, comes in, tries his kits, doesn't really find interest, anything interesting, and he slowed down a great deal. Um, and I don't know what your security defenses are like. Frequently, they are time-bound, and that can be incredibly dangerous because the people who are coming into you or investigating your security systems understand that, and they have tailored their behavior to it. So uh, I guess he like went to sleep or got a coffee or something here, but he comes back. And here he finds something interesting. And 
He explores a little bit to confirm that the exploit that he thinks is there is there, and then he calls up his buddy Hodor. He's like, Hodor, I think I found something interesting. What do you think? Hodor, Hodor comes over and spends five minutes confirming what John's thesis is, that like, there's something here that is usable. Then they call up our buddy, the Night King, and the Night King comes in and he says, hold my beer, watch this, we're going to town right now. And uh, thankfully, you know, he was not being cautious about how he was coming in or what he was doing, uh, but my friend might not have noticed anything that was going on if the Night King had taken his time and been as cautious as his predecessors. And I mean, this gets completely into the, uh, the knowledge, right, that these people are organized in teams and they're like super crazy aggressive and they understand your defenses and are working against them. So keep that in mind the next time you get an email that says LinkedIn lost 12 million, you know, account addresses. Like they could have been trying very hard to keep them and it just didn't pan out. So here's three things that you're going to be able to do as you leave here and go back to your business um, to help try to make this better. First thing you can do, good fences, make good neighbors. Anybody else here from the South heard that before? That's right. Good fences make good neighbors, buddy. That's the way we say it. We live it. We breathe it. Uh, totally true. Don't make it easy. The game of security is not about how to make yourself invincible. The game of security is about how to make somebody else more appealing than you are. You don't have to outrun the bear. You've got to be faster than the slowest guy because the bear is going to get the slowest guy. Um, so you need to patch your stuff. You need monitoring for this. You need a plan because trust me, if you have a friend like my friend that gets a security event, you do not want to be in decision making mode as you are reacting to what's going on. You want to know like, this is how we're going to respond. This is what we do. Everybody goes into like automatic overdrive and to that point you need to be drilling on it. Uh, don't keep it in a piece of paper and a blue folder over it, you know, Jim from DevOps desk, you're going to pull it out like you're going to need to be fast and you're going to need to be decisive when the shit hits the fan. Pardon my French if there are any children in the room. All right, second thing you can do, partner up with a bug bounty service. It's a very like tenuous relationship that you may need to build. We have built this at Real Self, and it has been like so enlightening. And it's enlightening not only because it gives us real insight into what security researchers and pen testers, the tools that they're using and how they go about it, but it gives us a chance to validate our monitoring. And like the most important part of this at all, from my point of view, is that Pounder Partnering up with a bug bounty service brought every developer into our shop into the security lifecycle management, right? Like everybody who's writing code on our floor is thinking about what's going to happen with our um, hack for hire service. And they are much more defensive coders. I'm much more defensive as like a designer and automator of infrastructure. Like this is super, super important to, to make this real for your people. And uh, the last thing that you can do is really devalue your data at rest. So uh, in many ways, the name of the game is to get in, get out, and then figure out what the value of the data that you have is, right? Um, if you can make it to where that problem is computationally expensive or confusing or encrypted or whatever, you will be doing yourself a favor and that's gonna pay dividends like in the longer term game in case your perimeter defenses fail or your application layer defenses fail, like you can rest slightly more easily um, once you've done that. And as an industry, we are, oh, I just, all right. I don't know what's gonna happen here with the slides in a second, but uh, you know, we'll work it out. All right, so uh, audience participation time again. Who's got good defenses? Who's got good border security? Yeah, right. Who's paired up with Hack for Hire? Any? Oh, nice. Yeah, totally. For those of you that are not raising your hands, seriously, man, like hook up on that. If you want me to bore you with a long diatribe about how valuable it is, even longer than this one, I will be happy to do that after I get off the stage. Uh, who's devalued their data at rest? Anybody doing like data? Uh, very good, very good. This one's actually super valuable even without the other ones. So I mean like you should leave with a happy feeling in your heart if that is a focus that you have been um, going on. Yeah, I'm like running long here. So I have one more slide and then I'll get out of here. 
Uh, so back to the hug ops, not the shame ops. When these kind of things happen, it is not because operators or developers or anything else has been negligent. It's because data is super valuable and there are people who want data. I mean, pretty simple premise. That's what my business runs on. Probably also what your business runs on, right? Uh, and there's a, uh, a favorite quote of mine from a man, John Dunn, wrote it in uh, 1624, almost 400 years ago, real future vision kind of guy. Any network devices pwn diminishes me because I am also involved in network devices and therefore sin not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. End of talk. <laughs>